Good morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 40, verses 1 through 5. The psalmist writes, I wait patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew, up from the pit of, he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of my miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud or to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God. Your wondrous deeds, your thoughts towards us, none can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we gather in your presence this morning, Lord, thank you for each one here. Father, how true it is, is your goodness and your mercy towards us is more than can be told. Father, as we come this morning, may our worship honor you in all that we do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. With that, let me invite you to stand for our opening hymn. So we're super, super happy about that one. Uh, two, you know, if you see Jeff and I continue to wear our mask at, uh, up, up here, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Austin sent out a decree Friday to, uh, for a little bit for the increased mask measures. Have you heard uh, President Biden talk about the 100 days of masks on federal property? So even inside, we gathered in groups. And uh, right now, everybody will stay masked all the time. So. So if you wonder, why is Chaplain Jeffrey still got his mask on? Well, that's why. And, uh, and with that, so we'll, we're, uh, the, the chief of chaplain's office at all is, is working with him as well to see if uh, first speakers we can make an exception. But anyway, all that to say is just realize that's what's going on there. And, uh, and with that, and I'll welcome everybody. They got a little bit ahead. For those of you who are here in person, y'all are like the bravest people ever. As I looked at my car and it was six degrees as I made my way just from the house down to here. And uh, so thank you for your devotion and uh, being here. For those of watching online, welcome. We are glad you're here and, uh, as well watching online. Again, reminder, next Friday, the, uh, the vertical marriage piece and uh, will we'll, we'll kick off. So go on to the, the website, fortleavenworth.org or fortleavenworthchapel.org and uh, you'll see the registration and all the, the, the pages where to get registered at and how to watch you know, in person and on. Uh, uh, if there's no longer room for the seven couples or for the seven couples in person and to watch online I forgot if there's no longer room for the seven couples in person to be able to attend so that starts this coming friday the 12th and the following friday on 19 february chaplain brian our family life chaplain here at fort leavenworth will have uh his serve his uh marriage enrichment seminars and as well going on but both of those slides and all the information is located on the website and, and kathy is good about getting and uh, that information out as well. And, uh, and other than that, I believe that is all our major announcements. Again, thank you so much for being here. 
uh, for taking time to come and be a part. And with that, let me invite you to stand as we continue in him this morning. of faith. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. With that, you may be seated. As we come to our, our time of, uh, of prayer, a couple of things uh, to make you aware of. And uh, one, most of you have probably been tracking that, uh, the, the passing of Linda Jarvis. It does. Uh, so we want to keep uh, the Jarvis family in our prayers. Dan, as I go through that, it's coming Wednesday at, at Davis Funeral Home will be the uh, the service and then graveside. 
uh, here at, at Fort Leavenworth Cemetery, uh, National Cemetery, to be here. So continue to keep them in your prayers. Linda Stevens has, has driven and, and should be in Chattanooga, Tennessee by now, but has driven to Tennessee for the burial of her mom. So continue to keep her and, and the family in your prayers and all with her as well. And uh, uh, Dana Pitts has asked him to keep um, her mom and her husband as they're not feeling well in, in our prayers. And uh, with that, and then continue to keep Marsha and Sherry and, uh, in our prayers as they continue to recover and, uh, and get better, as well as other the others on our prayer request. I remember that at the, uh, Judy uh, Wells as well, with uh, as she recovers from her fall and the broken bones she sustained there. And uh, with that, so with that, let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in Thessalonians, you say, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. <clears throat> Father, your word brings great comfort to it and is the reminder for us as your saints that death is not the end of the journey, but the resurrection reminds us that we are raised again to new Christ, our new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, as we remember the Jarvis family, Lord, her testimony has been so faithful throughout the years as I've talked to others you know, who have worked with her in PWFC and Vacation Bible School, and I have mentioned her with fondness and great tenderness. Father, thank you that we have eternal life in you, that death is not the end, but it is merely the passageway into your presence for all of eternity. And so, Lord, we pray for her. Lord, we, we lift up the Jarvis family and Dan, ask your compassion and grace to be with them. And Lord, as Linda has, has driven to, to Tennessee and as she is there, Lord, watch over her, keep her safe and keep her safe as she returns home afterwards. Help everything that goes smooth that needs to go with all the funeral preparations and everything that goes along with that. And let your compassion and mercy be manifested in those situations. And may hope be ever present, part of the, of the assurance of the resurrection and all that we have in there. So Father, we pray for them in their time of grief and loss and just lift them up before your throne of grace. Father, we pray for each other, you know, whether it be at, uh, some of our, our men of the chapel or the ladies of the chapel who are recovering from different forms of cancer and undergoing different levels of treatment. Lord, let your grace be in the midst of all of them. Lord, all the saints here have the, the testimony as Paul is when he talked about that when you reminded him that your grace is sufficient for a thorn that he recorded in his flesh. Lord, let through each of these situations your glory be manifested and your sufficiency of provision of grace to meet the need of the time be ever present in all of them. But Father, we pray for each other. Lifting each other up as the body of Christ. For those things that we've spoken and known and those that are unknown, that you be evident and part of all. So, Lord, we lift each other up. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together. That you are the provider of our daily bread. You are the one who forgives our trespasses. So, Father, we acknowledge you in all these things. And we close out together as we pray in unison and as the body of Christ. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And with that, we invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to receive this morning's offering.
Lord, it follows, Lord, your grace far exceeds and is abundantly more than we all can imagine. Father, we come as an act of worship to present our offerings and our tithes to you. Bless them and use them to your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 24 and 25. I'll be reading from the New International Version. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Word of the Lord. Good morning once again. What a joy it is to have you here with us and those who are joining us online. Uh, you know, this text, as we began looking at uh, last week, has a lot to say to us as a body of believers. Uh, those of you who have been with us for a while know that we have made this transition going really from what God has done for us in Christ as our high priest and as the perfect offering and how he has enabled us. And this is what we talked about last week to enter into his presence that we can draw near. And remember what a, what a glorious truth that is that now we may enter into the presence of the holy, righteous, one true God. But not only are we able to enter in, we are encouraged to hold fast to that hope, that confession, hold fast to the doctrinal truths that are there that strengthen us in the faith. Remember, we just simply talked about how these are, if you will, descriptions of a healthy church. So a, a healthy church is a place where we may gather and enter into the presence of God. And so we, we have worship. We have the proclamation of the word that enables us to move into the presence of God and worship him and glorify him. And it's a place where the word of God is proclaimed. It is a place where we recite the confessions of our faith as a reminder of who we belong to and the hope that is ours in him. But there's one more important aspect of that healthy church or a healthy body or a healthy Christian. And that is what we are going to discuss today uh, as we talk about our responsibilities, not just in drawing near to God, not just in holding firm to the confessions of our faith, but our responsibilities to one another, our hope to one another. And what I want you to see is that a healthy church is not defined by attendance. It's not defined by the number of people who fill the pews. And of course, in this day and age, it's certainly much more limited. But it's not defined by attendance, but rather the attentiveness of its members. So it's not the number in the pew, but rather it is our attentiveness to one another. God has called us into a community, and that is one of the key takeaways in this discussion of the let us. It's very, very important. He's not saying let you, you as an individual, which we should do, right? Our faith is an individual responsibility, but God has called us into community. And this community has responsibility as we gather together in worship of him. It's not just a place where individuals come, rather it is where the community of faith gathers. As we look at our text here this morning, what we really wanna to try to answer is, is what is it that we ought to be doing for one another? 
What should occupy our time and attention when we gather? Whether it's gathering here in the local body, whether it's gathering a small, small, small group for discipleship, but what should be some of the things that are on our mind to guide us in being the body of Christ that God wants us to be? To be a healthy body to glorify him. And as we look at our text, um, I, I, want, I want to focus, first of all, helping us to understand the, the attitude that is there and, and what should occupy our minds. And then we'll transition to a little bit more as to how that would look like. Okay. So we're, we're going to talk about what we should think and the whole idea of our focus toward one another. And then three ways that that should be occupied or lived out as part of the community of Christ. And so with that, if you will, bow with me in a word of prayer and we will look at the word of God together. Father, we come to you today longing for you. We come wanting to have more of you to worship you, to honor you, to give you all that you rightfully deserve. Lord, I confess, certainly there are times when it is so easy for us, myself, to be caught up in the day-to-day -day responsibilities that we overlook, the joy, the honor, the privilege that is ours just to be at your feet in worship. Now, Lord, as we look into your word, we understand that there's great responsibility that we have toward one another as well. Grant us understanding of your word today. Draw us ever closer to you and one another that we would be the body of Christ here for your glory and for your honor. And we ask, O oh God, that you would do this and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. First, again, we want to talk about what it is that we ought to do, how our process should be, our attitude or our thoughts. And then we will begin looking at three ways that we can live this out. So first, I want you to notice as we continue on with the let us, remember he says, let us draw near, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith. And then in verse 24, here's the third let us. Let us consider, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here's the attitude. Here's the mindset is that we ought to consider the amplified Bible uh, translates it to writes it out this way it says and let us consider and give attention continuous care to watching over one another that's that's the attitude that's the mindset that is being communicated here when it talks about simply consider one another the idea of the word consider is to take note of something, to look at it carefully to such a degree that you are making account of it. It means to contemplate on something, consider it attentively and very literally. It means to think about something from the top to the bottom. The word in the Greek has the preposition kata to it which means down. And scholars tells us that what that means is that it's emphasizing the whole attitude of when you think or when you perceive something, you are focusing down on it. You are looking at it and upon it thoroughly. This is the main verb of our text this morning. Consider one another. This word was used previously in Hebrews chapter 3, speaking of Jesus. You remember that text, verses 1 and 2? 
Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heaven, heavenly calling, consider Jesus, right? And he goes on to say, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. And the author is saying, take a moment, pause, and look upon Jesus. Think about him. Meditate upon him. Ponder upon who he is and what he has done. We see the same word in James chapter 1. You remember this from our previous study. When it talks about the individual who looks at himself in the mirror. And it's the idea that he is, or the individual is glancing at himself to the point where he's able to understand. And if you remember in that day, they didn't have the beautiful mirrors like we do now that would provide the perfect reflection. They had to ponder on it. They had to look at it intentively to try to perceive the reflection. Is, is that beginning to paint the picture? That as the body of Christ, that we ought to consider one another. We ought to contemplate, think deeply about one another. Now, obviously, we, we tend to do this and we do it in a variety of ways. And if we're honest, sometimes those ways are not so good. You know, it's, it's easy at times to look and, and just as those of old, we can look on the outward appearance and we say, hey, you know, that, that jacket that the chaplain wears, he wears it all the time. Or we might be able to look and, and, and maybe, you know, the, a hair of someone has changed. And, and we notice these little insignificant small things. And it could be as simple as where a person sits. And maybe this is the person that's always coming in late. Or maybe they're always in here too early. Our tendency sometimes in the flesh is to focus on things that we should not focus on so much. And what the scriptures are encouraging us to do is to have a kind of focus, but that focus is turned in a way that we're thinking positively. We're considering, we're thinking deeply. Certainly, I know there are a lot of faults in our minds today. For some of us who are thinking, man, you know, I know the weather's supposed to get a little bit worse later. You know, hopefully we'll be able to make it back home. I know I was thinking earlier, it's like hopefully my, my battery is charged well enough to where my, my vehicle will even crank. Some of us are thinking about the Super Bowl. It's going to be happening a little bit later tonight. We used to say when services were closer to lunchtime, we would be thinking about the meal and what we're going to cook and eat together there are a lot of things that can occupy our time the music the sermon but do we think about the person to our left or to our right what about the person we have not seen or heard from in a while what about those people who we know are struggling emotionally physically do they enter our minds? The scriptures are saying they should. We ought to consider one another. Christianity, as one commentator wrote, Christianity is not an individual religion. It is a community of faith. And we have responsibility to one another. I'll share with you the words of Richard Phillips in his commentary, the Reformed Expository Commentary. He says this, and it's cut me, and I want to share the love, and I encourage you in the same. He says, we are accustomed to think only of ourselves, but our thoughts are better given to others. Is someone doubting? Is he discouraged? Is she tempted? Without needless prying, we should give thought to the condition of those around us. If we are not doing this, then we are nothing more than takers, consumers of religion who are little use for the eternal destiny 
of other people. Some sharp words. But the scriptures are encouraging us to consider one another. To not just come and find our seat and sit down and think about what's going to happen at the end of the message or the end of our time of gathering, but to think about one another. In what ways are we to think about one another? In what ways are we to consider one another? Well, this is what I want to focus on as we continue to the rest of our text. And what I see here are three ways that we are to think about and consider one another. Three ways, if you will, that we ought to be focused on one another as a means of encouragement. First, he goes on to say this, that we ought to consider one another on how to what? To stir up one another to love and good deeds. What I want you to see is that we consider one another and encourage others toward the work of faith. Christ calls all of us to bring out the best in each other. Believers must actively and verbally stir up one another to love and good works. A healthy church does this and does it well. An unhealthy church fails to do this. So what does it mean to stir up one another? Well, very literally, it's to stimulate that person. It has more of a negative connotation in the word. So literally, it is to provoke someone or to irritate or to agitate. The idea is that there is a poking that by the poking, it leads to action. Right? So it's, a, it's more of a negative term that is being used in a positive way that we ought to think about one another and think how we might encourage them to what? To the works of faith. And how do we do that? We stir them up. We incite them. We provoke them. We agitate them to what end? To love and to good works. You know, I think to me, as I was studying this, one of the best ways to understand the idea of stirring one another up is, um, is, is when you really think about like building a fire. I don't know how many of you have a fireplace at home or uh, love to be outside and have a big bonfire. I know here recently we put in a fire, uh, a fireplace, not really a fireplace, what would you call it? A stove. Yeah, there you go. A wood stove. We put a wood stove at our place. And it's interesting, right? The idea would be that I'll put some wood in it. It's burning throughout the day. And I make sure it's nice and, and, and uh, full when I go to bed. And the idea would be when I get up in the morning, you know, it's still burning just a little bit. But I can't tell you the number of times when I get up and I go and I, I head into the other room and it's just a little bit of embers burning there. So it's, it's mostly black from the ashes and you see just a little bit of bright burning ember. And there's been one or two times where I would go in and all you see is the black ash. I mean, there, there's no burning embers at all. And I'm thinking to myself, what do I do? Because it's, you know, it takes a while to get the fire going. But I've learned after doing some reading and watching, I've learned that if I open up my stove and I get what they call the poker, I, I get my fireplace tool and I get in there and I poke around and I stir around and lying underneath all that ash is still burning coal. And I move it around and I get those like items of coal together and, and the heat is still there. And then all I got to do is to put in the fuel, which in this case is more wood. And in a matter of moments, the heat that is there, having those embers together, causes the fire. And in a sense, that is what God is calling us to do. That stirring of the pot, that moving around of the ashes, to helping one another to, 
to throw off the the desires, the issues, the struggles of this world and to burn brightly once again. In this case, with love and with good works. And I think part of the reason why this word is used by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is part of that encouragement, part of that stirring up is convicting people. It's using the word of God to say, brother and sister, here's what I see going on in your life. Or maybe just by what they're observing and how you love other people, they themselves are convicted. But the whole idea is that we're stirring up, we're moving, we're shifting, we're causing that fire to burn again and move toward love and to good works. The love here certainly is the word agape, which speaks of the sacrificial love. It's easy to love people when I see the benefit for myself. Much harder to love people when there's nothing to be gained. Yet that's the Christian love that ought to be expressed in the body. To love people when you know they can't give anything back to you. But you love them because of the love that we have received from the Father Through the sun. We stir people up to remind them to burn brightly in displaying that love. As Jesus says, by all this people will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. And united in good works. These are the attractively good. The good that inspires or motivates others to embrace what is lovely. And in the same way, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, but the light shining on the hill, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. You know, it's easy sometimes to let our flames burn out. It's easy sometimes in light of the stresses and the worries and the concerns of this world just to coast. That's why we need one another. That's why we have to be considerate of one another and contemplate on one another so that we would be aware on how and when we need to stir one another up to continue to display this love and this good works. I don't mind, think that they would mind me sharing this, but Many of you know that once COVID hit us, uh, one of our greatest concerns of a, of a church, of the chapel here, is, is how do we maintain contact with the body? There are so many things that could be going on with one another. And if, we don't, or if we're not actively communicating, then it's kind of hard to know what's going on, what the needs are of the body. And so we establish our deacon ministry simply for the purpose of looking out for the body. We've got several good, faithful men who are watching out for you. And some of you perhaps know who your deacon is and they're supporting you and serving you in a variety of different ways. But we had one family and uh, and they kind of included me in their deacon ministry. This is David and Kay. I hope they don't mind me sharing this. And David and Kate came out to visit us around Thanksgiving time. And just as they were out visiting all the others in their deacon ministry, they said, Chapel, we want to stop by and just say hello to you. So we sat outside for a while and just talked. And when Christmas rolled around, they came out and visited again and brought it like a, a little gift, some fragrance that we could burn in the house. And you know, it was just something small, you know, to them perhaps it, They wish they could probably have done more, but that small thing was just a a beautiful act of love. And even for me personally, I even felt a little convicted in a good way that maybe I should be doing this as well. You see, it's the little things that we do and we do considering one another that stirs us up. 
that reminds us of who we are and who we belong to. And we are to do that toward one another to lead us to sacrificial love and good works. Let me ask you this. Does the way you handle yourself provoke others to take seriously what the Bible teaches? Does your counsel cut against the grain of worldly logic and press home the claims and the promises of God? Does your behavior set a helpful model for weak or new believers? If not, you're not making the impact upon the body of Christ that God is calling us to. He's asking us, he's calling us to consider one another and we consider one another and we encourage one another in the work of faith. But then secondly, we consider one another and we encourage others in what I would call here the health of faith. So we're stirring one another up for, to love and to good works. But then notice what he says here as we go into verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. The context of what he is saying here is that the incitement to love and good works happens in the body as the people of God are meeting. The community is where the stimulation is to occur. As one scholar says, we can't love, encourage, and urge each other if we're not around each other. If we neglect meeting together, then we cannot do the stirring up that needs to take place. Al Mohler goes on to say, we cannot have confidence and full assurance of faith apart from the body, apart from the church, and we cannot endure in isolation. The health of the church, the health of the Christian is not a role or a journey in isolation. The health of the church, the health of the Christian is a commitment in community for the glory of God. Go back, if you will, to my little example about the coals and the fire. You have heard this, I'm sure it's a rather uh, frequent analogy that you can move some of those coals or maybe you have a log that still might be on fire just a little bit. You can move it off out of the main section off to the side and that coal or that log will continue to burn just for a little bit. But eventually what? It's going to go out. But yet you bring that log or you bring that coal back in right where the heat is, right where the glow is. And it's going to light right back up. And brothers and sisters, you and I are not called to be long ranger Christians. We're not called to run this race of faith alone. We're called to do this in community. And it's in that community that we stir one another up toward love and good deeds. That's why he says, not forsaking the assembling. Again, the context is that this takes place in the body as we are gathering. But when we neglect the gathering, as the habit of some has, then we're not in that position healthy as we ought to do. And I firmly believe as we will talk about next week, that's the reason why he starts talking about those who are struggling in the faith. Those who are weaker in the faith. God has called us to be in community. It's interesting, as I was reading a commentary by William Lane, he talked about how naturally you would think that some of these believers were no longer gathering maybe because of fear. <clears throat> maybe there was a fear of, of persecution. Maybe there was a fear of just simply being identified with 
the church. Remember, part of the reason why the author is writing this letter is because the believers are being persecuted and they're naturally wanting to go back to the old way to avoid this persecution. And so it's natural to think that maybe this is what's going on here. William Lane, however, he points out in um, some letters that uh, have been found uh, that's dating back to a house church. I believe this was in about the second century. Uh, He says that in reading these letters and the concerns of the body, the, the issue was the preoccupations of just normal business life. You wouldn't think that. But just the normal preoccupations of business life were keeping those from gathering together. And how true it is for us today. You know, maybe I stayed up too late. Maybe I've got so much to do. I've got to, I've, I've got to make up time. There's always a reason. But the health of the Christian, the health of the church is in the gathering and the community. Moeller says this, those who neglect assembling together cut themselves off from the very means whereby Christ feeds, assures, and protects his people. You know, as I've been thinking about this, once again, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And... We can't have, thankfully now, we've moved up to 20 families. But yet, even as Chapel McDonald and I were discussing uh, about a week or so ago, one of the hardest things to do is to tell people, we, we just don't have room for you. You, know, you, you, just, you can't come to church today. We, we just don't have room. But to me, the biggest struggle is not necessarily us having to tell people that we don't have room for you to come in and join us in worship, but the idea that some might grow too accustomed to it. That there is a sense of joy, there is a sense of comfort to be able to sit at the house, turn on the tube, link in to Facebook, and just get the word. Participate in some way in a service in the comfort of my home, in my pajamas with a nice hot cup of coffee. That that is at times appealing. Brothers and sisters, I want you to see that is not what we are called to. We are called to community. And I know in this environment, we cannot all gather together. But let your heart still beat for the church of God. Be committed to the community. For some of you, might, that might be just gathering in your small group right now. For some of you, that might mean that making sure that, that you sign up early so that you're able to come to the service. For all of us, we're praying that we might get to the other side of this to where we can all gather together. The point is that none of us should ever get to that point where we feel as if we are okay with God and God is okay with us just by being at home. God has called us to community. And it is in that community where we love and serve and grow together. And I encourage you to make that a commitment to your life and family as well. So we consider one another and we encourage others toward the works of faith. We're stirring them up to love and to good deeds. And we encourage one another when we uh, pursue the health of faith, the healthy body, by joining and coming together. And then we consider one another and encourage others toward the hope of faith. The hope of faith. And this is what we see in the very last part of verse 25. Right? So if you look at this, the 
the, it's a participial phrase, really, in verse 25. Those of you who are still in school and you're learning English, you know what that is, right? The main verb is to consider one another and provoke one another. And how do we do that, really? He's saying, by well, you, you don't do it by neglecting each other. You do it by encouraging one another. But what I'm wanting us to see here is that that responsibility for us is that we're stirring up, we're committed to the body, and then there is a specific role of encouraging toward this hope of faith. So he says specifically here, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This word that's translated encouraging is, is the word that's also translated in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where that very famous phrase, I beseech you or I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies to Christ. It's the idea of calling others to your side. You're like walking with them, but yet you're there calling them to come to where you are. So it's that idea of encouragement. It's an up close and personal exhortation. As George Adams reminds us, encouragement is oxygen to the soul. And so we are encouraging one another. It requires us to come alongside one another. It requires us to have a little bit more knowledge about one another. Again, this isn't knowledge to look down. This is knowledge to build up. If I am aware of a brother or sister that is struggling in faith, then I have the knowledge and wherewithal to be able to, to be that encourager to help them in the faith. And so it requires us not just to know the name and children's names. It, it requires us to enter into a relationship. It inquire, requires us to be really a part of a body. That's how we can truly encourage one another. We come alongside people. With our words and with our actions, we strengthen them in Christ. That's literally the idea of encouragement. We pour courage into one another. And notice he says that we ought to encourage one another. How so? As we see the day approaching. As we see the day approaching. The word there, see, talks about being perceptive. You're aware that the day is approaching. The real question is, what's the day? There are those who look at this text and say that the day very well could be the destruction of the temple. And it makes sense because there are believers who are still struggling with going back to a sacrificial system, thinking in some part that it's still required, thinking in some part that it's still okay, so they can avoid persecution. And so some scholars look at this and say that maybe this day that is coming is the destruction of the temple where there will be no more sacrifices. And you need to be aware so you can encourage one another because that's going to hit them a little bit harder. But I think in context, the day is speaking of the coming of the Lord. When Christ returns, that we need to encourage each other daily, regularly, but even more so as we are perceptive, as we are aware that the day when Christ is to return is approaching. And we can see that in context. Hebrews chapter 9 talks about Christ having offered himself once to bear the sins of, money, of many will appear a second time. And then later, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37, talks about how yet in a little while and the coming one will come. And so when he speaks of the day, I believe he is speaking of the coming of Christ, that we are to encourage each one another. Now, why? Because it's so easy for us to be distraught with all that is going on in the world. It is so easy for us to be wrapped up in the values that are here that we forget 
that our residence, our home is in the heavens. And that's where we're going. And Christ is coming back for us. The whole idea that all of our hope is in him. And the day represents the day in which Christ will return and reminds us that the promise is fulfilled eschatologically. Our hope and faith is in Christ, but the realization of that day is future. And we need to encourage one another. Times may be hard, but there's a day coming. There's a day coming where we, by God's grace and for his glory, will enter into the presence of God. And we will see him as he is. In this life, in this world, there is going to be trouble. But as he says, take courage. I have overcome the world. Our hope is in him. And there may be times in your struggle where you're getting weary. You're tired of the fight. You're tired of pushing through. But hold on. Cling to the faith, the truth that is ours in him. And encourage one another to do the same. You know, it's important for us to be healthy. It's important for the church to be healthy. And I hope you see that you and I have a role in the body of Christ to maintain that healthiness. Sure, an individual's relationship with Christ is an individual relationship. Yet we're called to community. And we have responsibilities to the community of Christ. And you know what that means? That means when we enter these doors, it's not just to sit and prepare ourselves for the service, which is very, very important. But it's to be mindful of one another. To consider one another. To think deeply about one another what they're going through, where they've been, what they are facing, so that you might come alongside them to encourage them, to strengthen them, to stir them up toward love and to good works. I pray this morning that each of us would answer that call. I pray this morning that we would see that we have responsibilities to one another and that we would no longer look at and to one another the same, but see a ministry and think about how we can serve one another that God will be glorified here. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Father, we are so grateful for what you have done for us. We are so grateful for the hope that is ours in you. And God, it is our desire to be the body of Christ here that we would be your hands, your feet, and do the work that you have called us to. And so many times, as important as it is, so many times we think of service and we think of ministry to others outside the walls. Very rarely do we think about our service and ministry to one another. Help us, O oh God, to love one another in a way that would honor you. Help us, oh Father, to, to move together in a relationship, Father, that we would know and understand struggles and weaknesses, that we can truly encourage and stir one another up. God, that you would be glorified here and that you would be honored by the work of your people for your glory. We ask, with God, that you would do this as we look to you now, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we close out our service in song. And communion, and then song. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. What a wonderful opportunity it is in light of our calling together in community to partake of the Lord's Supper together. And that's what this is all about, our communion with Christ and what he has done for us. I would encourage you now that to prepare your hearts to receive the supper. 
thinking about him and what he has done. I remind you that according to the word of the Lord, that when we partake of this supper, we proclaim his death until he comes. The juice reminding us of his blood that was shed for us and his body reminding us of, or the bread reminding us of his body that was broken. Remember just last week, we entered to the presence through the blood that was shed and through his flesh. And this is what's reminding us. We worship in thanksgiving for what God has done for us in Christ. The Bible tells us that in the night of which Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread and he broke it and gave thanks and says, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us worship. And in the same night, he took the cup and he says, this is the cup in the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's worship. encourage you to come back next week. You don't want to miss it. Hebrews has been a struggle for many because of four passages uh, that are there that are called the warning passages. We will hit the fourth one next week. And yet there's hope for us who are in Christ. And so I encourage you to come back again as we tackle this passage and remind ourselves of the hope that is ours in the Lord Jesus. Please receive the benediction. Father, we would pray, O oh, now, as we depart here, O oh, God, that you would go with us. And as we go out into the world of missions, help us to shine brightly for your glory and honor. Watch over each, O oh, Lord, now as we go back home. In your grace and your mercy, allow us to make it home safely. And we pray, O oh, God, that in your grace, that you would bring us back next Sunday again to worship. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you.